So in book five of Achilles, Achilles Tadius's Laocipian Clytophon, Clytophon writes the following to his beloved, quote, you will learn that I have imitated your virginity if that word has any meaning for men, that, as it does for women. That awkward caveat, if that word has any meaning for men, highlights something that those of us working in virginity studies now take for granted. Virginity, linguistically and conceptually, is an unclear term. It is also an acutely gendered term. Parthenia is ambiguous, as anyone attending the seminar surely knows, because of the ways in which it describes a sexual history, a marital status, a stage of life, or some combination of those and more meanings. It is likewise gendered in its nearly exclusive application to girls and women. Thus, Simon Goldhill writes that virginity is a term inapplicable to men in earlier Greek culture. Francois Meltzer highlights for us that this gendering is not merely a linguistic phenomenon, but it's baked into the ways patriarchal societies discuss virginity. In her study of Joan of Arc, Meltzer writes, although virginity is in fact a transgendered state, the body of a female virgin answers to a different demand for proof. Male virginity is generally less prized civilly and more difficult to inscribe anatomically. And neither problem, neither the ambiguity of the term nor its gendered nature is unique to the Greek language. The German Jungfrau, the Korean Chonyo, the English word maiden, and for my paper, the most relevant one, the Hebrew Betula, all share the problem of these overlapping meanings. Ambiguity and unclarity resulting from societal assumptions about gender and sexual activity, leading to linguistically ambiguous terms for what we too casually call virginity is a transcultural phenomenon. So too the gendering of virginity, both linguistically and conceptually. The Hebrew word bitula, which commonly we translate as virgin, but which is grammatically feminine and applies only to female virgins, has no masculine complement. In Hebrew, the feminine is usually composed by adding a hey on the end. So we would, if bitula is a female virgin, we might expect betul to mean a male virgin, but there is no betul in the Hebrew Bible or subsequent Jewish literature. The male gendered counterpart to the betula in both the Hebrew Bible and rabbinic literature is not the betul, but the bachur. The word bachur comes from the root for choice or select. So a bachur is a young man in the prime of his life. Consider, for example, Psalms 148, verse 12, bachurim vegam betulot, which the NRSV reasonably renders as young men and women alike. The word for young women has overlapping and confusing valences of uh, virginity and young womanhood. The word for young men, however, points to their vitality and worth with no allusion to their sexual histories. This incongruity makes clear that for biblical Hebrew as for ancient Greek, virginity is incorrigibly gendered. It's therefore unsurprising that rabbinic literature and here by rabbinic literature, I mean the works produced by a group of Jews living in two geographical centers, one in Roman Palestine and the other in Sasanian Babylonia between roughly the second and seventh centuries CE. This corpus expresses little to no interest in male virginity, despite the fact that huge portions of this corpus attend to female virginity at times in excruciating detail as I'm sure many of you are familiar with. In this paper, however, I want to suggest that while male virginity receives nowhere near the attention in rabbinic literature that its female partner receives, it is also not entirely absent. In particular, we will see that later texts, probably beginning in the fifth century CE, introduce male virginity into rabbinic conversations where it had previously been ignored. I will consider three texts in particular, and I hope it's okay if I lower your expectations at the outset. Only the last one of these texts unambiguously considers male virginity. Nonetheless, these three texts taken together represent a kind of sub rosa rabbinic concern for men's premarital virginity. The first text I want to, to address here is also the earliest of the passages I will consider. It comes from the Mechilta of Rabbi Yishmael, a work of early rabbinic midrash. The precise dating of this work is debated among scholars of rabbinic literature, but the dominant approach treats it as containing material 
that originated in the one or two centuries prior to the redaction of the Mishnah in the early third century CE. That's a terrible way of saying. This probably comes from the first two centuries CE, what rabbinists call the Tanaitic period. The relevant passage is a Midrashic reading of Song of Songs 4, verse 12. A garden locked, Gan Na'ul, is my sister, my bride. A garden locked, Gal Na'ul, a fountain sealed. The verse features two similar, but not identical Hebrew phrases. Gan Na'ul, with an N sound on the end of that first word, and Gal Na'ul, both of which are rendered in the NRSV as a garden locked. The Midrash offers three different readings of these two terms. Let's begin with the second and third interpretations, neither of which mentions men. Both read the verse in the context of sexual ethics. According to Rabbi Nathan, this is interpretation number two, the verse praises both married women and engaged women. Now definitionally, or at least definitionally by the rules and assumptions of late antique rabbinic culture, married women are not virgins. The epithet locked garden then, at least this first time, refers not to women's virginity, but rather to a woman's marital fidelity. The woman is locked insofar as she keeps out other men, men other than her husband. It's not about virginity, but marital fidelity. Something similar is probably at work in Rabbi Nathan's application of the second locked garden, the Gal Na'ul, to engaged women in the Hebrew Arusot. The English translation engaged women is misleading. The word Arusa assumes a rabbinic definition of hetero marriage, whereby the first stage of marriage, engagement, is a legally binding process, after which the couple are still not permitted to engage in sexual relations with each other, but the female is now legally forbidden to other men. Therefore, though the invocation of Arusot, engaged women, may to the English speaking reader hint at virginity concerns, more likely the intent is the same as with the married women, namely, both engaged and married Jewish women are praised, according to Rabbi Nathan, for their marital fidelity and not necessarily for their premarital virginity. Were virginity of primary concern in Rabbi Nathan's interpretation, we would expect a third legal category, perhaps kyuyot, available women, or bitulot, that problematic word that I began with. Interpretation number three is, I think, even more opaque. Here we're told that the two expressions of locked garden, gan na'ul and gal na'ul, refer to the two penetrations. The Hebrew word biot, literally comings, and commonly translated in such contexts as I've translated here as penetrations, certainly signals in this setting sexual concerns. And typically rabbinic Hebrew uses the phrase penetration in its way, bia kedarka, to refer to penal vaginal intercourse, and penetration not in its way, bia shelo kedarka, to refer to penal anal intercourse. The passage thus echoes other places in rabbinic literature where authors engage the potential relevance or potential irrelevance of anal penetration to defining female virginity. But that's not clear. It may also refer to anal sex as violating adultery, right? So we still don't know if it's about sexual ethics generally or if there's a specific resonance of virginity. In any event, this is the context for the interpretation that is at least potentially relevant to my paper today, namely male virginity. What does it mean in this context, in interpretation number one, to say that the locked gardens of Song of Songs 412 refer to men and women respectively? Gan Na'ul, these are the men. Gal Na'ul, a fountain seal, these are the women. A meaning related to sexual ethics is clear enough. Interpretations number two and three are both about sexual propriety, and therefore presumably number one is as well. And this is not coincidental. The Song of Songs generally, and Song 412 in particular, with its erotically charged tones, is a likely candidate for rabbinic discussions of sexual behavior. That does not mean, of course, that when the opening interpretation is offered, it invokes virginity, male or otherwise. Just as Rabbi Nathan's interpretation in number two was primarily interested in the marital fidelity of Jewish women, whether fully married or only engaged, so too this first anonymous interpretation may be praising Jewish men like Jewish women, for their sexual ethics more generally. It may have nothing to do with virginity. One final point about this Midrash before I consider its development in a later form. 
the introduction of men as the referent of the first locked garden, the Ganaul, whether or not virginity is intended, is a striking choice. Remember the verse, a garden locked is my sister, a garden locked, a fountain sealed. The first half, a garden locked is my sister, this Midrash claims is the men, while the second half refers to the women. This choice is surprising. Why would the author of the Midrash connect the first half of the verse, which explicitly references my sister with men, while the second half, which has no clearly gendered phrase, gets applied to women? Wouldn't it make more sense to reverse the interpretation? A garden locked is my sister refers to women, and a garden locked, a fountain sealed, refers to men. Here, I very hesitantly will suggest that the choice in this Midrash to connect men to the first half might reflect a notion that a fountain sealed may be even more strongly gendered female for the Midrash's authors than the phrase, my sister. Like Ambrose roughly a century and a half later, perhaps this Midrashist hears the language of seal and thinks of conceptions of the female body as sealed. Uh, and I'll point, I'll add, I hadn't thought about this until Avital's presentation, but the blessing over Bi'ilat Mitzvah that she was referring to is number eight in her presentation, actually references this part of the verse, uh, a sealed fountain as part of the blessing over that first act of uh, Bi'ilat Mitzvah. Now, I'm wary of the suggestion that the notion of a sealed fountain is what is more strongly gendered female than even the phrase, my sister, because I myself have suggested elsewhere that the notion of a hymen in rabbinic literature, as has been shown by Julia Sissa for Greco-Roman literature and by Julia Kelto Lillis for early Christian literature, that the notion of a hymen is a relatively late development in rabbinic literature as well, generally not found in texts redacted prior to the year 400 CE. So my suggestion here actually is an argument against something I wrote earlier, which I still think is right, right? That's, uh, but I, I think we have to at least recognize the possibility that something like that is going on here. Uh, in any event, this Midrashic tradition appears again, but with important differences in a later work of Palestinian Midrash, Leviticus Rabba. In this version, we find only two interpretations of that same verse, Song of Songs 412, but it will quickly become clear that all three versions found in the Mechilta are still represented here. Let's start with the second of the two interpretations. Uh, this is the one it taught here in the name of Rabbi Nathan. Uh, this interpretation, the interpretive tradition, is identical to the third one in the Mechilta. It equates the two slightly different formulations for a locked garden with two kinds of sexual penetration. The only difference is, and I see so, no significance in them, is that unlike the Mechilta, which presented this tradition anonymously, Leviticus Rabbah presents this one in the name of Rabbi Nathan. But this sort of confusion of attributions is very common in rabbinic literature and usually is not significant. As well, the later version in Leviticus Rabbah makes explicit what is meant by the phrase two penetrations, using the standard rabbinic phrases, penetration in its normal way and penetration not in its normal way. The more interesting changes have occurred in the first interpretation of Leviticus Rabbah, which combines what had been two distinct interpretations in the Mechilta. So you see here that Rabbi Pinchas says, the first garden locked, these are the virgins, Bitulot. The second garden locked, Gal Na'ul, these are the penetrated women, a horrible translation, but one I think is accurate, meaning pre presumably meaning previously married women. A fountain sealed, these are the men. Uh, and this next slide summarizes the differences between the version in the Mechilta and the ver version in Leviticus Rabbah. Now, the Midrash interprets not only the two phrases meaning locked garden, but also the third term, a sealed fountain. The two appearances of locked gardens, Rabbi Pinchas claims, refers to virgins and previously married women. This is very similar to the Mechilda's second interpretation, but with one important difference. The Mechilda's second interpretation distinguished between engaged women and married women. Two categories of women who, according to rabbinic marriage law, are in legally binding monogamous relationships. As I said earlier, in the Mechilda's version then, the emphasis is on marital fidelity with little or no concern about premarital sexual activity. By contrast, the later Leviticus Rabbah's version explicitly mentions bitulot, which whether we translate it as virgins or unmarried women, introduces the specter of virginity as a, or perhaps the relevant concern. 
Finally, this version goes on to read a sealed fountain as referring to the men. This choice is perplexing. I just suggested that the Mechilta's counterintuitive assignment of men to the first half of the verse, the my sister half, resulted from the phrase, a sealed fountain and its potentially strong resonances with female virginity. Here, however, that sealed fountain, the same sealed fountain that will appear in that blessing over the first act of wedding night coitus, that sealed fountain is associated precisely with men and not with women. Now, this entire Midrash is ambiguous, which makes this association of men with a sealed fountain particularly difficult to parse. The Midrash mentions Bitulot, for whom the rabbis are presumably concerned with premarital virginity, and Bitulot, for whom the rabbis are presumably concerned with marital fidelity. Men, unsurprisingly, I suppose, are not broken down into differentiated categories based on their marital or sexual status. So what aspect of Jewish men's sexual practices are the rabbis praising here? Rabbinic literature is generally uninterested in either men's marital fidelity or their premarital virginity. Probably the most likely intent here is that the Midrash praises Jewish men for not having sexual relations with married women, with other men's wives, or perhaps for not engaging in penile anal intercourse with another male. Those are both ideas that come up regularly in rabbinic literature. But the passage is opaque, and the juxtaposition of men with female virgins and married women, with the men referred to as a sealed fountain, at least places men in the vicinity of virginity. We can see how the tradition in the Mechilda has developed in Leviticus Rabbah, such that if male virginity is not yet a topic of rabbinic concern, we can at least see how we might be starting to get there. The second text I want to consider brings us a couple of centuries later. One exactly is unclear, but for some rough context, I will say the fifth or sixth centuries CE. The Babylonian Talmud on folio pages 7a to b of Tractate Ketubot discusses the seven blessings, the Sheva Brachot, which are required to be said for a newly married couple. The relevant passage begins with a statement attributed to the early third century sage Rav. Rav states that these seven blessings are a requirement irrespective of the status of the bride. Whether she is a bitula or a widow, an almana, these blessings are obligatory. Now, you might have noticed that I was doubly evasive when I summarized Rav's statement just now. To begin with, while I translated the Hebrew word almana, widow, I left the word bitula untranslated. And I described Rav's ruling as applying irrespective of the status of the bride. The obvious question though is, which status of the bride? Is Rav here interested in the fact that the bride is a virgin, i.e. she's not previously engaged in some kind of sexual behavior? Is he interested in the fact that she's young? Is he interested in the fact that she has never been married before? I'm not gonna rehash yet again the decades of arguments about the ambiguous and too often overdetermined meanings of words such as bitula. But what those debates make clear is that the different possible meanings and translations of such words are not binary. A Parthenos is not either a virgin or a young woman. Rather, both meanings and more are inherent every time we use such a word. So, when, when Rav therefore states that the seven wedding blessings are obligatory, whether the bride is a bitula or not, he may have had primarily marital status in mind. These blessings are required whether the bride is previously married or not. But notions of virginity are necessarily imbricated as well. Rob's auditors imbibe the thought that a woman's sexual status is relevant to the liturgy recited at her wedding. Now I'll return to the overlapping meanings of sexual history and marital status shortly, but now back to the Talmudic passage itself. After the statement of Rob requiring seven wedding blessings, whether the bride is a bitula or not, the Talmud objects. We're now in line B here on this slide. One of the sages transmitting Rav's statement, you will note in line A, was Rav Huna. Rav Huna, however, in line B, is alleged to have stated the opposite. A widow does not require the seven blessings. In order to resolve this contradiction, how can Rav Huna transmit the rule in line A when it's clearly at odds with his own view as preserved in line B? The Talmud asserts that these two statements are discussing different cases. This is now line C. Rob's requirement for seven blessings, even where the bride is not a bitula, applies where the groom is a bachur. 
And recall that bachur is that word I discussed at the outset of this paper, a word that appears often in both the Hebrew Bible and rabbinic literature as the male counterpart to the betula, in which I've translated here for lack of a better term as first time groom. Rav then, as reinterpreted by the anonymous voice of the Talmud in line C, was saying that where the groom is a bachur, the seven blessings are required, irrespective of the bride's status. Rav Huna's statement, as reinterpreted by the Talmud in line C, now applies to a case where both parties to the marriage previously have been married. In the language of the Talmud here, the, there, are no seven, there are no seven blessings where an almon, a masculine form of the more common word almana, widower, marries an almana, a widow. The chart on the next slide summarizes the conclusions at this point, which I realize may be necessary given the complexity of, of the Talmudic passage. Uh, notice that in this understanding, produced by the anonymous editors of the Talmud to resolve an apparent contradiction between two earlier statements, neither of which mentioned men's status, sexual or otherwise, neither Rav nor Rav Huna mentioned men, but the reinterpretation now makes the status of grooms relevant. If either party is getting married for the first time, the bride or the groom, seven blessings are required. Here, for the first time, a man's status matters. Now, as I've already mentioned, it's not clear what specific status we're talking about. I think most readers of this passage, whether of a traditionalist bent or a critical bent, have read and do read the Bahur here to mean a first time groom, irrespective of his sexual history. The fact that Bitula has a complex and overlapping set of valences that include, but are not limited to sexual history, does not lead inexorably to the idea that the male counterpart, the Bachor, is likewise ambiguous. But as with Leviticus Rabbah's praising of men alongside married women and Bitulot, the pairing here of the Bachor with the Bitula in a context that is inherently sexualized, the seven blessings are according to rabbinic law required to permit sexual relations between wife and husband, this pairing necessarily muddies the waters in a way that partially mirrors the ambiguity of the Bitula. The passage may imply then. So what, what I was saying, hopefully some of this at least came through is that the word almon is a problematic word, right? Unlike uh, the word al almana, uh, well, all right, it, it's not a common word. And, uh, and even though it seems straightforward because it's just almana with the last hey dropped off, masculinizing the word, uh, we'll see it's not so simple. While the word almana appears many times throughout the Hebrew Bible, only twice do we find there this root in masculine form. In one of these cases, Jeremiah chapter 51, verse five, the word is vocalized slightly differently, alman rather than almon. And in this context, the verse is, Israel and Judah have been forsaken, alman, by their God. The word is an adjective rather than a noun. It's metaphorical rather than literal and it's applied to nations rather than individuals. It is not an example of describing men using the marital statuses typically applied to women. In the other example of this word appearing in the Bible, Isaiah 47 verse nine, the word is vocalized as almon and does appear to be a noun. However, commentaries and dictionaries based on the context understand the word to mean widowhood rather than widower. In other words, Masculine forms of the word almana appear only twice in the Hebrew Bible, and in neither case does it describe a man using the marital or sexual status. The situation is the same in the earliest strata of rabbinic literature. The word almon does not appear in Tanaitic corpora, to remind you that's those texts dating from the first two centuries CE. Only when we get to the later works of Talmud and Midrash, none of which was redacted prior to the year 400 CE, do we find occasional use of the word term almon to refer to a male widower? It never appears with anything remotely like the frequency of almana, even in these texts. Now, probably none of this is very surprising. In patriarchal cultures, women's marital status matters and men's marital status matters less, if at all. It therefore makes sense that a word to refer to a man as previously married develops only late and never becomes a common word, as common a word as its female counterpart. But the rabbinic construction of the almon, 
effectively following the rules of Hebrew linguistics to chop off the final letter He from the word almana and thereby masculinize it, this process highlights a path not taken with regard to virginity. We have an almon, but there is no betul in this text, only a bahor. The development of the almon then makes clear that the absence of the betul from rabbinic Hebrew, which too often people take as a natural phenomenon, was not at all inevitable, even within the patriarchal assumptions of rabbinic Hebrew. If the rabbis could have created the almon, they also could have created the betul, but they did not. Widowhood, while certainly gendered, was at least legible to late antique Hebrew speakers as a concept relevant to men. Virginity, by contrast, was not so much. This text about the seven wedding blessings then introduces male, marital, and or sexual history as a legally significant category. But even as it does so, it reminds us of the gargantuan gap separating female virginity from male virginity in rabbinic thinking. Can you still hear me? Sometimes when I type on my computer, that's what makes the microphone go off. Am I still audible? Great. The final text I want to consider here today is the only one in which male virginity is unambiguously at issue. The first chapter of Bavlik of Babylonian Talmud Ketubot is an extended consideration of female virginity and its verification. One particularly extended pericope considers the different kinds of standards by which a man in rabbinic culture might prove or disprove his wife's wedding night virginity. The passage ends with a series of seven stories of men accusing brides on their wedding nights of premarital infidelity. I've analyzed both the legal back and forth and these stories in my book, Signs of Virginity, focusing on the implications both for female virginity and for the constructions of a rabbinic ideal of masculinity. But one of these stories also provides a window onto rabbinic thinking about male virginity. In this legal story, a groom comes before Rav Nachman to accuse the, his new wife of not having been a virgin on their wedding night. Specifically, this groom claims that he, quote, found an open door, which in the context of this Talmudic passage means he's accusing his wife, not based on a lack of blood on the sheets per Deuteronomy 22, but rather based on his experience of insufficient vaginal resistance during the act of penile vaginal intercourse. Rav Nachman responds by ordering those in attendance to beat the accuser, beat him with palm spades. The reason, as I will discuss shortly, is unclear. In any event, this is a surprising moment. The Talmudic passage until this point has emphasized the power of grooms to accuse brides on their wedding night of premarital infidelity. We as readers are primed to expect Rav Nachman to order the new wife divorced and deprive her of her prearranged divorce settlement, her ketubah. Instead, he orders the groom lashed. The passage goes on to exacerbate the cognitive dissonance that Rav Nachman's response generates. In what I've labeled here as line C, the narrating voice of the Talmud reminds us that earlier, Rav Nachman himself had stated that grooms making open door accusations are to be believed. So what's going on here? Why is he beating this groom when he said that's a valid and acceptable claim? The passage that ends, I've cut seven out for the sake of time, with the resolution of one Rav Achai, a very late sage, who states that a previously married groom is believed when he makes an accusation based on his experience of penile vaginal intercourse on the wedding night. The testimony of a first time groom, however, a bachor, is not only rejected, but the bachor in question receives lashes. There is a lot going on in this short passage. To begin with, the meaning of line B is obscure. Because the Hebrew and Aramaic of the Talmud have no punctuation marks, it's ambiguous if Nachman's utterance is meant as a statement or as a rhetorical question. I've translated it here in accordance with the second possibility, a rhetorical question. Rav Nachman says, beat him. Has he previously had penile vaginal intercourse? If you follow this translation, the beating is then a punishment. Uh, sorry, the following this translation, the question is rhetorical. Of course, he hasn't had sex before. The beating is then a punishment for cavalierly accusing a woman without proper evidence. The groom in question is not punished for his premarital sexual history, but rather for his brazenness in his accusing his wife. Still, the assumption is clear. 
Jewish men are assumed to be virgins on their wedding night. That's why we can't trust this man when he accuses his wife of being insufficiently narrow. The other possibility, reading this line as a statement, not a rhetorical question, makes the claim even clearer. Rav Nachman says, essentially, beat him, because for him to make such a claim based on his perception of coitus necessarily means that he's had previous sexual experience. The Talmud's characterization of Rav Nachman's views about male virginity is thus clear. A man should be a virgin on his wedding night. The groom in question, by accusing his wife based on his own experience of the wedding night coitus, has revealed himself not to be a virgin, and he is therefore worthy of receiving lashes. Now, even the implication that men are assumed to be virgins on their wedding nights, and all the more so the suggestion that they are required to be and can be punished for not being so, these implications are pretty significant outliers in the rabbinic corpus. <clears throat> Nowhere else do we find in rabbinic literature such a notion so explicitly. Tal Ilan therefore rejects this entire interpretation, irrespective of the nuances of Rav Nachman's statement or question. She rejects the idea that the Aramaic phrase mevarchata chavitale, translated by, by me here as he has struck the ditch, she rejects the notion that that phrase has something to do with premarital sex. She writes, and I'm quoting here, since no Talmudic text ever suggests that men should be punished for being sexually mature when entering wedlock, this could hardly be the original intention of the text. Elon's point is well taken. She suggests that the traditional reading of this passage, particularly as rendered by the hugely influential 11th century commentator Rashi, says more about the sexual ethics of medieval Jewish Europe than it does the attitudes of rabbinic authors in late antique Babylonia. However, Rashi was not alone in understanding the passage to indicate disapproval of the young man's marital sex life, premarital sex life. Early medieval Babylonian commentators, whose interpretation I have followed here, understand the phrase differently from Rashi. Yet, like Rashi, they also understand the phrase as referring to some uh, act of premarital sex. We thus find two distinct interpretive traditions, one from 11th century France, one from 10th century uh, Babylonia, two in distinct interpretive traditions from two different times and places, but both of which amount to the same conclusion. The young man is likely beaten precisely for his lack of sexual restraint prior to marriage. This makes it quite likely that what we have here is not an excessively obscure passage as Talilan would have it, but rather one that is difficult simply because it is an outlier in the broader rabbinic discourse of virginity. Elon is correct that this doesn't fit with what we know from elsewhere, but that doesn't mean that it means something other than what the words here say. Moreover, when we get to the conclusion of the story and the Talmudic discussion thereon, Rav Achai's resolution in line D, the pertinence of male virginity, no matter how surprising it may be to us, becomes clear. A first time groom is not believed should he accuse a bride on their wedding night. Indeed, he's to be beaten, either because we assume he's a virgin and therefore shouldn't know what sex is supposed to feel like, or because he's not a virgin and he's beaten for that act. Either way, the passage is surprising in expressing male premarital virginity as a rabbinic desideratum. So to what might we attribute this unexpected mini bubble of rabbinic interest in male virginity in the fifth century or so? Let me begin with the most honest answer I can muster. I have no idea, and I don't trust anyone who says they do. We have so little material expressing this interest that even more so than is typically the case when we study antiquity, we have to be extremely speculative. That said, I think it's instructive to compare this development with roughly contemporaneous developments in rabbinic ideas about female virginity. Ayelet Liebsen has argued, to my mind convincingly, that the Babylonian Talmud is unique in the rabbinic corpus for its interest in human subjectivity and for its incorporation of subjectivity into its legal decision-making. Building on Liebsen's work, I argued in my book on female virginity testing that the later strata of the Babylonian Talmud those that are roughly contemporaneous with these last two texts I shared with you, those strata exhibit a shifting standard for testing virginity, a shift that was another manifestation of rabbinic preferences from objective standards to subjective standards. For early Judaism, including early rabbinic Judaism, virginity was something visible, something marked on the body. And as in so many pre-modern cultures, 
it could be marked only on a female body. But once rabbinic authors in late antique Babylonia shift more and more to increasingly subjective standards, applying such a standard to men becomes more legible. The same factors that moved the sight of female virginity from blood on the sheets to the mental perception of a groom might have been the same factors that made men subjects of and subject to virginity. Thank you.